Thank you very much, sir, for uh, your generous comments, totally undeserved. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you heard about uh, the complexity in science. The complexity of Indian culture is no less. The problem about uh, speaking of Indian culture is that whatever you say, uh, the opposite is equally true. So, whatever I would say, please remember that the opposite would also be true. And culture is something about which everyone has a view. So, your views are as good as what I am going to say. Uh, as you know, the topic is the changing cultural paradigm. Uh, here the problem is whether we all know, we are experiencing it, we are seeing it, that culture is changing. But whether it is a paradigm change or whether it is a process of change which has been going over centuries is something which I think we have to discuss. And uh, I don't think I have any final questions, I mean final answers. And I doubt if I, anyone can say with finality that yes, it is a paradigm shift or it is not a paradigm shift. Uh, the problem here is that uh, change in Indian culture has been going on over the millennia for various reasons. I shall not go into the history of it. Uh, for example, the introduction of law from Mesopotamia in prehistoric times would have changed the culture. And that probably would have been called a paradigm shift. Uh, the British introduced the iron plow. It used to be wooden plow earlier, which again changed the way um, our agriculture was done and you know, so on. You know, the term paradigm itself it was brought into common currency by Thomas Kuhn in 1962. It's a very recent thing. And that was in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. So it's a concept from science which has been taken over and now we are talking of paradigm shift in social sciences, paradigm shift in this, paradigm shift in that, paradigm shift in culture. Christoph Capra then later on adapted this term and he said a paradigm is a constellation of concepts, values, perceptions and practices shared by a community. Now here I am quoting this because the question here is shared by a community which forms a particular vision of reality. That is the basis of the way a community organizes itself. The vision of reality and sharing of community. Now, this is where the problem comes. What is one's vision of reality? Uh, and culture. Uh, interestingly, no Indian language has or rather had a word for culture. Uh, Sanskriti is now used it's a neologist coined very recently in the uh, uh, early 20th century or maybe 20s or so of the 20th century. Before that, we did not have a word corresponding to culture. And Sanskrit, as I said, is a recent coinage. Uh, now, Sanskrit, if you, if you say Indian culture, you have one kind of a vision, which is inclusive, which is Indo-Aryan, uh, 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 Dravidian Aryan, uh, Indo-Islamic, and Indo-British and all that. But when you say it in one of our Indian languages, and you call it Bharatiya Samskriti, the uh, complexion changes. So when you are talking of Indian culture, and changing of paradigm, it depends on which classes are you seeing it through. Are you seeing it through the classes of Indian languages or are you seeing it through the English classes? 
Now, um, the culture, the word culture itself uh, comes from the Latin cultura, which means cultivation, growing. I mean, Cicero used it first, called it cultura d'anime, which means cultivation of the spirit, cultivation of the mind. And uh, then it was adapted. And uh, before you say that, well, in Indian languages it is a recent coinage, even in English, it dates from the early 19th century. Uh, it's used in the sense of collective customs and uh, achievements of a people dates from 1867 only. So we were not very far behind in coining the word Sanskriti in our languages. Except that in Tamil, Sundram would bear me out. He has looked at the dictionary, the uh, English Tamil dictionary, and it is Kalacharam. But Kalacharam also is a coinage and is related to Kala. Apart from this, leaving aside the uh, Nagamese and Mizo and those languages, in every Indian language, the uh, concept is Sanskriti. Now, talking of Bharatiya Sanskriti, Sanskriti then is from the same root as Sanskara and Sanskrit. So you are giving it a certain colouring when you say Bharatiya Sanskriti. Uh, this becomes relevant in the context of the debate that is going on about Sephronization, about Hindutva on the one hand, and globalization and westernization on the other. Now, Hindutva itself was uh, a term coined by Savarkar. He is the progenitor of this concept of Hindutva. And interestingly, Savarkar himself was an atheist. He was not a Hindu in the sense that we understand. And uh, uh, one of his poems, he was a prolific writer in Marathi. In fact, he presided over Marathi Sahitya Samelan twice. And in Maharashtra today, he is uh, revered as much as an author, as a freedom fighter. In fact, Rath. Professor Rath of Tandekar and Rath, Poverty Line fame, uh, was talking to me and he said that he was a great admirer of his writings in Marathi on social issues. And as you know, Rath is no votary of Hindutva, he's as much on the left as can be. But Savarkar, this, this poem, I'm just uh, reading one bit of it, it's like a school anthem in Maharashtra. Says Jayos Tute, Jayos Tute, Shri Man Mangale Shivas Pade Shubade, Swatantrate Bhagavati Twa Maham Yashoratam Bande, Rashtra Se Chaitanya Murtutum, Niti Sambadasi, Swatantrate Bhagavati Shrimati Ragni Tutyasi. Now, here, this is a hymn to Swatantrata independence. And he envisions Swatantrata as a goddess. Uh, Bhagwati. But the interesting part is the connotations for a Marathi uh, with the words like Shivaspade and Bhagati would take him to Shivaji and that rule. So here is an atheist who is envisioning uh, the independence, the Sotantrata, as a as goddess Bhagwati, as Bankim Chandra in Vande Matram envisioned. India, Bharat Mata is Durga. So you can see that the debate which is now taking place has its roots long back in our history. And I will read another uh, uh, stanza from a Hindi poem this time that was Marathi. Sansar ko pehle hamine gyan shiksha daan ki. Uh, I suppose. All of you understand Hindi, otherwise I will translate it into English. Sansar ko pehle hami ne gyan shiksha daan ki, achar ki, vyapar ki, vyavhar ki, vijyan ki. Phaila yahi se gyan ka alok sab sansar ne. Jagi yahi thi jag rahi jo jyoti ab sansar ne. Yah kunne bhoomi prasid hai, iske nivasi aare hai. Vidya Kala Kaushalya Sabke Jo Pratham Acharya Now, 
संसार को पहले हमी ने ज्ञान शिक्षा दान की है वी वॉज द फर्स्ट टू गिव दाइट ऑफ नॉलेज टू द वर्ल्ड वी गिव द नॉलेज ऑफ गुड कॉन्डक्ट ऑफ कॉमर्स एंड ट्रेड ऑफ साइंस पहला ये इनसे ज्ञान का आलोक सब संसार में द लाइट ऑफ नॉलेज वॉज स्प्रेड इन द वर्ल्ड बाई इंडिया एंड द लाइट विच शाइन द लाइट ऑफ नॉलेज विच शाइन इन द वर्ल्ड originated here in india and this is the blessed land which is famous and the inhabitants of this land are aryas and they are masters of knowledge of arts of technology etc and this is now this is what you would say is being said by the votaries of hindutva isn't it and this is what one says is Sephardization all about, but this poem was written in 1912 by an arch congressman, Maithri Sharan Gupt, who was a close friend of Pandit Nehru, wore khadi all his life, spun charkha, and was a member of the parliament till he died. So now. A, the vision of Indian culture of a staunch Congress side is this. So this is where the problem comes when you are talking of sephronization or paradigm change in uh, of culture. Now, which culture are we talking about? There is one problem. As I said, one doesn't have answers to these questions. Uh, I would say that uh, what has been said that. कल्चर 